The following is a presentation of Be Well, a multiple media health information project presented by WVIZ PBS, IdeaStream. Funding comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, the Woodruff Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County. The rate of severe obesity in the United States has skyrocketed over the last decade. Fast food is a large part of our culture. It's our lifestyle. If you don't turn it around, you're going to be obese and overweight. We are literally eating ourselves to death. I couldn't get around. My family had to do everything for me. I couldn't even tie my own shoes. And I'm, I'm almost 50 years old, and I, and I got to look at where do I want to be? And, I, and I'm thinking, man, I, I got to lose some weight. And that's, that's kind of what was my wake-up call. We've lost focus in this country of what a normal weight looks and feels like. It boils down to saving money. Obesity is an expensive disease. Part of the obesity epidemic is that we need healthy food. We need access to it. Kids in this neighborhood are not eating as well as they should. They're eating a whole lot of junk food. The diet started sliding. The fast food started creeping in. The physical activity became less, and I was a mess. I had six of the eight risks for stroke and heart attack staring at me in the face. There is no doubt about it, things are getting bigger. The patient weight limit for ambulances, for instance, used to be 800 pounds. Now, ambulances can accommodate patients who weigh 1,000 pounds or more. CT scanners used to have a 60 centimeter opening. These days, they are 80 centimeters wide. A standard size casket used to be 24 inches wide, but today, 29 inch wide caskets are in high demand. Hello, I'm Rick Jackson. Things are getting bigger because we are getting bigger. Obesity has become a national epidemic. For the next hour, you'll hear stories from local people who are waging their own personal wars against weight. Plus, we'll talk with experts who will help us to look beyond the bulges to understand the science and medicine of obesity. Why do people gain weight? And what's at stake for all of us if we don't stop this deadly trend? And make no mistake, it is a trend. It started back in the mid-1980s. Back in 1985, the TV show Miami Vice was a big hit on NBC. I was on NBC as well. Here I was hosting the morning show at Channel 3, right here in Cleveland. That was nearly 30 years ago, and yes, I admit, nearly 30 pounds ago. In 1985, there were eight states where 10% of the population was rated as obese. As you can see, Ohio was one of them. This map, and those that follow, were created by the Centers for Disease Control to track the progression of the obesity epidemic. Now, look what happened in just five years. In 1990, the number of states where 10% of the population was obese quadrupled. Five years later, in 1995, we change color and go to dark blue. That's because in these states, up to 19% of the population was obese. Just two years later, in 1997, big trouble. Tan states start appearing. Tan represents 20% or higher prevalence of obesity. By the year 2000, lots of states are tan. Some are turning orange. That color indicates that 25% of the people living in those states were obese. Red states started appearing in 2005. No, these aren't Republican states. These are states where 30% or more of the people were regarded as obese. Finally, in 2010, lots of orange and red. All told, a dozen states with an obesity prevalence of 30% or higher. And things are projected to get a whole lot worse if current trends continue. A new report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation indicates that by 2030, all 50 states could have obesity rates of 44% or higher, and one in three adults could have type 2 diabetes. I'm joined now by Dr. Matthew Crow, a surgeon in the Digestive Disease Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome and thanks for coming in today. Certainly, we want to ask you what happened. Why this dramatic increase? Well, it's a complex answer, and we don't really have all the answers quite yet. It's an interaction of increased consumption, less physical activity, and probably genetics that we're really just starting to see uh, really the tip of the iceberg with. And at the same time, you have to wonder, how did we get here? Did we not see this coming? Uh, the answer's not as easy either. Um, the multifactorial nature of this really doesn't give us an answer as to why we're here now. 
I think there's been significant predictions of this, mm -hmm. but the enormity of it is really becoming more compelling, especially when we look at the, the medical problems related to obesity. You talk about those medical problems, there are certainly health consequences beyond just being big. Absolutely. Uh, and that's really the burden that our society has now. So things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, sleep disturbances, and a whole slew of other medical problems are related to weight uh, and obesity. So it's not just a weight problem, but it's a significant medical burden. And when we look at people that are obese, we see different sizes and shapes. It's where the fat is located that's just as important as having the fat. Absolutely. So depending on where the fat is, it's related to different types of medical problems. So fat in the torso and the chest and the abdominal area uh, tends to be more sinister than peripheral fat. The, the fat around the torso and the chest tends to be related with heart disease uh, and more significant problems that can impact people's lives in terms of overall quality of health as well. At the same time, we don't want somebody who's watching right now to say, well, my fat's elsewhere, I'm okay. Absolutely. All fat in severe quantities is related to significant medical disease and burden. Uh, just different types of fat are related to different types of medical diseases. And it's not just the physical anomalies we worry about, but there's an economic impact here too. Suddenly you're paying more for everything that you have to do. There are impacts down the line because of your size and your, your bulk. Uh, significantly. A and those range from uh, social disturbances and personal disturbances, but as a, as a surgeon uh, and a physician, we really look at the medical burden of this. Chronic long-term disease, both in terms of uh, mortality and morbidity, things like diabetes, ischemic heart disease, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, are all, re all related to obesity. When you talk amongst yourselves as doctors, are you afraid for the country where we're going right now? I think so, uh, but we have a whole slew of physicians, uh, both at the Cleveland Clinic and elsewhere, looking at this at a deeper level. So at all levels, both preventive uh, and kind of in-stage intervention, uh, I think we're addressing the problem. Talk to me about the future. 20 years down the line, do you see us having turned the corner or do you see it getting worse? And what are the consequences of each? Well, the consequences are significant. I think that we have a more sophisticated understanding of what goes into severe obesity and the medical problems with it, uh, but we're going to need a multi-pronged approach to effectively deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it, you're saying that's terrible, but if we do, can we turn the corner? I, I think we can. I think that uh, chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease related to obesity, uh, we're understanding the mechanisms with them and also the interventions that are going to circumvent those problems. Okay. Dr. Matthew Crow of the Cleveland Clinic, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Many of us consume way too many calories. Fast food, processed stuff that's full of sugar, salt, and fat. And to top it off, many of us supersize it. You mix that with our modern sedentary lifestyle and it spells trouble. If you follow the typical American lifestyle, there's a good chance you'll become obese. That's exactly what happened to 48-year-old Randy Carty. His day of reckoning came at a most unusual spot. I've always been an active guy and I've always enjoyed amusement parks and roller coasters. My wife insisted we go to Cedar Point a couple summers ago and who would have thought a visit to an amusement park would be the turning point, the eye-opener, uh, where I decided to turn my life around. But you weren't always overweight. Tell me about you as a child and in high school? No, I was a very thin, small child. Uh, I graduated from Brunswick High School weighing about 150 pounds. Randy enlisted in the Army and served as crew chief for Huey and Black Hawk helicopters. The Army kept him in great shape. You run, you physically train, you're physically active. So what happened after the Army? I uh, started working and going to school to become a respiratory therapist and you know, burning the candle at both ends, working and going to school. Uh, the diet started sliding. The fast food started creeping in. The physical activity became less. Randy's hobby with cars added fuel to the fire. I'm a hot rodder and a classic car guy. I go to a lot of tracks. I race. I go to car cruises. And what do they serve there? Burgers, dogs, fries, shakes which unfortunately, at that point, as a single man, became the mainstay of my diet. Most of my friends were larger guys, and when you're around that crowd, you fit in. It sneaks up on you. You look in the mirror, you don't realize that, oh my God, you're 290, 300 pound mark, 310, 320, and then before you know it, you're 350, 360 pounds. I got married three years ago. My wife married me heavy. And uh, she kept telling me, you're always a handsome man to me, but uh, 
you need to turn this around a little bit. I had no person to blame but myself. I knew better. I had been in the military. I'm a critical care clinician of 18 years. I just let it go. And you went with the flow? I went with the flow. I have nobody to blame but myself. I did it to myself. So everything was kind of creeping up slowly. Slowly but surely. My shirts went from extra large to 2X and then towards the end eventually 3X. Take us back to that day at Cedar Point. What happened? I wanted to ride the Raptor and they have a shoulder restraint that comes down over top of you and much to my amazement and shock I was five to six inches away from even buckling in and I have my friends and family with me and it was extremely embarrassing and I got frustrated and I threw the thing off my shoulders as a heck with it and I got off the ride and I stood on the platform with my head hanging low in disbelief that I can't fit on a roller coaster. I am too fat to fit on a roller coaster. Oh my God. And I remember feeling so depressed and upset about this. I went over to a hamburger joint and I ordered a double cheeseburger, fries and a shake. And I sat down and I began eating it. I thought, well, if I can't ride the rides, I'm going to have some good food. On Valentine's Day of 2012, Randy got another wake-up call. Medical tests revealed he had diabetes and lots of other problems. And I was a mess. Uh, my body was going to blow. I had six of the eight risks for stroke and heart attack staring at me in the face, and I'm a non-smoker. Randy decided to have gastric bypass surgery at the Cleveland Clinic, a procedure that basically retools your insides so your stomach shrinks. Randy credits it with sending his diabetes into remission. So I knew that after this procedure, I had to drastically make a change, eating habits, lifestyle, exercise, proper nutrition was tantamount. And you discover quickly over the ensuing few months what you can and cannot eat. There's no carbonated beverages, no beer, no red meat, no fried foods. Something clicks and snaps when you have this procedure. I love seafood now. So you went from a 44 waist mm -hmm. to a 32? 32s. These are the new me. Skinny jeans. Yes, absolutely. Randy now weighs about 190 pounds. But the real payoff came back at Cedar Point when he returned to ride the Raptor with his wife. And the shoulder harness fit. Fit. <laughs> I was happy. I looked at her and I said, it, it fits. Sorry. It's, it's, uh, it was a good day. Two months after Randy's surgery, his wife opted to have the same procedure. It's an option a lot of people are choosing these days. Joining me now, Dr. Aviv ben Mayer. He's the medical director at the Center for Bariatric Surgery at St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. We will dive deeper into bariatric surgery in just a moment. But first, Dr. ben Mayer, do you see many patients who do become obese because of the lifestyle choices that they make? Well, I don't know if it's fair to, uh, to say it quite that way. I think that uh, a lot of factors go into people gaining weight and becoming morbidly obese. I think part of it is as simple as it some of us require fewer calories than other individuals. So a couple of hundred years ago when we were working in the fields, when we were farmers, uh, we could eat more calories, but we were expending them. Nowadays, uh, we have a sedentary lifestyle. We have uh, computer-based jobs instead of uh, manual jobs. And uh, we have readily available processed foods, high-calorie, uh, non-nutritious foods. I think all those things come together. So I don't think it's just not exercising enough or making poor choices. One of many elements. When we look at Randy's story there, as amazing as it was, is he a typical or a good candidate for bariatric surgery? I think Randy, obviously, he was an excellent candidate for bariatric surgery. He was 350, 360 mm -hmm. pounds. He was a diabetic. He had multiple risk factors for heart disease. Uh, he had a tool built for him. Dr. Schauer built him a gastric bypass. He's been using the tool correctly and he's lost weight. His diabetes has resolved. 
So he's a wonderful candidate. Tell me about how the surgery actually works. People have heard the phrase probably for years and don't know what actually happens there. Well, there are several operations that are available nowadays to help people lose weight. So the gastric bypass, the operation Randy had, was an operation where we simply help the patient feel full with less food. So our stomachs are the size of a football. Randy's uh, stomach was converted into two parts, one the size of my thumb, that's the part that sees food, and then the rest of the stomach is bypassed, hence it being called a gastric bypass. So now Randy feels full with a smaller amount of food. Somebody out there just said, the size of your thumb, really? Right, our stomachs are the size of a football, mm -hmm. and that can make it difficult to feel full from a normal sized portion. So when we perform a gastric bypass, we literally make the part of the stomach that sees food the size of my thumb. Okay. So at this point, once his stomach is smaller, he's eating less, what other maintenance does he have to do to keep the weight at 180, 190, where he is now? Well, gastric bypass is just a tool. So to be successful, there's an owner's manual. Patients have to follow that owner's manual. That owner's manual involves when you eat, uh, having a lifestyle change so that uh, you feel full within a small amount of time. So it, it uh, evolves around things like keeping the meals short, 20 to 30 minutes, not nibbling all day long, that's a way to avoid feeling full, not drinking with your meals, drinking with your meals flushes the food out of that thumb-sized pouch so you can eat more, not getting your calories from liquids, and making sure you have protein at every meal. Good list there. The bariatric surgery, does insurance cover this? I can't imagine this is an inexpensive operation. Uh, no, it's not an inexpensive operation. Most patients that have bariatric surgery in Cleveland and this country have uh, their insurance company cover it. Uh, not every insurance company uh, covers it for every policy. So each insurance company will have hundreds of policies and they may have an exclusion. Uh, do people consider this in some cases a lazy man's way of losing weight? I'll just shrink my stomach. It's not just something we should think about doing rapidly. Do people think that? I, I would say that probably a lot of people think that. Is that correct? No, I think that's part of the discrimination against morbid obesity. This is not a lazy man's way to lose weight. This is a choice that patients make once they feel that they can't lose the weight and keep it off without our help. Is there any point where we see a lot of people regressing, going back to their weight, or is this always a permanent fix? Uh, well, it's a permanent tool. Is it a permanent fix? I build tools for a living, and for somebody to be successful with that tool, I have to do a good job. The surgeon has to do a good job building that tool. The patient has to be taught how to use that tool, but then they have to use it. Dr. Aviv bin Mayer, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Medicine is a numbers game. Doctors use all sorts of numbers that act as benchmark measurements, quick and easy indicators to determine how healthy we are. Good vision is 2020. A normal temperature is 98.6. Your blood pressure should be 120 over 60. While we may not understand exactly what these numbers mean, we usually know what normal or good is. But what about our weight? 180 pounds may sound good, but not if you're five feet tall. So how do you know if you're fat or fit? The number doctors use to categorize your weight is called BMI, which stands for Body Mass Index. So you look like you're doing well. I am. Body Mass Index, or BMI, is a formula that uses a ratio of weight to height to come up with a number. Anything 30 or above is considered obese. The BMI formula was created in 1835 by Belgian statistician Adolf Quetelet. Now, hundreds of years later, it stands as a simple tool that helps doctors factor your fat. Many people realize that they're, they're overweight, but um, showing them the BMI gives us an idea and gives the patient an idea of, of how severe the problem is. Turn back, stand straight up for me. Many doctors use a BMI chart to pinpoint your weight category. You can find a BMI calculator on the internet. Just type BMI into Google you'll find about 5 million results. BMI is important because it's an easy tool that helps doctors assess your risk for killer diseases. People need to know um, their biometrics. BMI, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, their blood sugars. These are all important numbers that help us classify patients' risk for certain disorders, particularly cardiovascular disease and diabetes. 
But BMI doesn't work for everyone. It does not break down how much of your body is composed of fat versus muscle. Muscle weighs more, so an athlete can have a high BMI but be quite healthy. Waist size is another important measurement. Not all fat is created equal. The kind that sits deep beneath your belly is the most dangerous because it can harm nearby organs like the pancreas and the liver. There are other high-tech ways to measure fat like using air pressure in specialized chambers. No matter how you measure it, one thing is for sure, obesity is associated with lots of different medical problems. It is on the causal pathway to every major chronic disease that plagues our society, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, every bad thing you don't want to happen to you or someone you love, obesity makes it more likely. People with clinically severe obesity have a body mass index of more than 40. And in the last decade, the rate of severe obesity has skyrocketed. You might be thinking, how can people get that heavy? One reason lies deep within our DNA. Obesity tends to run in families. Scientists do not think there's one single obesity gene, but rather a combination of genetic factors all at work. And there's another factor that also comes into play, family culture. Certain ethnic and racial groups tend to eat lots of high carb and high fat foods. In our next story, we meet 56-year-old Rosie Nagy, who is waging a war on weight a battle that pits her against genetics and family traditions. I had two, so don't Good feel bad. I have so <laughs> we always get together, at least once a week my brother comes over, we'll play cards. We've always been a very close-knit family. Two. Okay. I mean, food was the centerpiece of what went on in our lives. Um, we just, when we gathered, there was always food on the table. That was what we did, we ate. That was part of our, our culture. My mother's side of the family was Italian. My grandmother was always, we always called her the food pusher. <laughs> now you have to eat. What do you mean you can't eat? You have to eat. Lasagna, uh, spaghetti. Uh, she made meat dishes, heavy laden sauces and the cheeses. And on my dad's side, he was Slovak and on Christmas Eve we'd gather together and the food was just Tremendous. So we, all, we had both sides on the holidays. It was just way too much food. Both of my grandmothers, my dad, my mom was heavy at one time, my brother was heavy, and a lot of my aunts, my mom's sisters, they got heavy over the years. But we didn't see ourselves as heavy. We thought we were normal. And I've had a weight problem pretty much my whole life. I was born a big baby and I was close to 10 pounds when I was born. It was hard growing up. For the most part, most people made fun of me. Never had a nice thing to say. So it, was, it wasn't a fun experience to go to school. I tried many times trying to get out of going to school or fake being sick. It's almost like what bullying is today. I mean, you just don't want to go. Probably in my mid-40s, I became my heaviest. I was starting to experience some health issues. I mean, I, I couldn't get around. I was 526 pounds. There were a lot of things I couldn't do. The emotional. <laughs> it was very hard because my family had to do everything for me. I couldn't even tie my own shoes. I couldn't, I couldn't get around. I couldn't work. People are very judgmental. Um, they don't want to get to know you. I am a person. You know, it doesn't matter what I look like. I was more embarrassed than anything. But they were my family and they were always there for me. I'm sorry. And I've tried all the book diets, no eating, none of them worked. I mean, they work for a while, but they're not teaching you the proper way to eat. So I wasn't learning anything, I was doing more damage. I was doing more damage to, to me, to my system. Um, I needed to learn how to eat sensibly, 
eat the things that I wanted to eat and still lose weight and continue on that. It becomes overwhelming. You don't think you're ever gonna be able to take it off. I will be heavy the rest of my life. Finally, one day at a Weight Watchers meeting, Rosie got inspired. She was determined and the weight started coming off. But then in 2010, Rosie was diagnosed with uterine cancer and had a hysterectomy. She learned less weight and more exercise could prevent a recurrence. So Rosie joined a health club. It was the first time she'd ever set foot in a gym. So what do you remember about the first day when you came to work out? I was nervous. I just didn't believe that I could be here and do anything because I was over, so overweight that I couldn't do much. And slowly but surely, you I, got into it. I did get into it. And when I think of my first day here and where I am today, um, I never thought I'd get there, but I, I am. I'm there. Losing weight has become a family affair. Rosie's mom lost 50 pounds, and her brother has lost 100. I'm thrilled I actually have a good hand. Try losing it and then not gaining it back. That is, that is the key. My mom, my sister, they've worked very hard at this. We still like to eat, but now it's like about making the right choice. Now at family gatherings, traditional lasagna is replaced with a vegetarian version. And so far, Rosie has lost 230 pounds. This is the happiest I've been in my life. I have a lot of friends that are true friends. They see me as Rosie, not somebody that's struggling with their weight or heavy or um, even though I am still heavy, people don't look at me like, oh, you know, who's that or we don't want to talk to you. So they go all the way up, all the way up. Bring it down again. You should be feeling that right. Uh, as you go on yeah. in life, you you have to make the choices, and you can break what's in your genes. I know it's not a life sentence, but I have to be the one to change it. Rosie is a classic example of someone with a genetic predisposition to obesity, and her case is compounded by the fact that food and eating is such a big part of her family culture. Dr. Eileen Seeholzer is director of the Obesity and Weight Management Program at Metro Health. She joins us now. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Such an emotional story, and we see that family played a big part in it. When you talk about family history, though, it's really two parts. There are the genes, the DNA that you come with, and then there's the culture, the ethnicity, whatever you have for an environment. Two really different problems to deal with. They are, but they, um, they are often intertwined. Um, so it looks like about 40 to 70 percent of our vulnerability to becoming obese um, is determined by genes. But that being said, the environment plays, we had the same genes we had 400 years ago when we didn't have uh, this obesity epidemic. So the environment um, really is the, the thing that, and some people will say, pulls the trigger as to whether obesity develops or not. Some of the stories we've seen people develop their size later. Rosie was always big, and that plays a big part in it. The fact that she's a big kid, she's going to be a big adult. Um, so there's two parts there that are very important. The first is um, we do know that kids who struggle with obesity, um, unfortunately, almost always in the majority of cases do become obese adults, which is problematic for a couple reasons. One is you talked to, as she talked about, um, she struggled a lot with the pain um, that the stigma that that obesity caused her socially growing up. Um, and she talked about how difficult it was to go to school um, and to just feel good about herself. Um, but the second uh, thing as well is those healthy habits with eating and activity are less likely to be learned as a kid when we might want them to be learned most because her environment didn't happen to include those things. She also mentioned the fact that her brother was heavy too. You say kids can be of different sizes based on how their mom is when the child's born. Yeah, so in addition to the f home environment, in addition to those genes we talked about that are, are exist when we're conceived, um, the environment for a baby actually starts in the mom's uterus when they're, when they're a fetus. And it turns out that um, 
as a mom gets heavier herself, the environment for that baby changes, and so that baby has a higher likelihood of becoming obese mm -hmm. or having a high birth weight, um, at least, and then developing obesity and, and diseases related to that later. Um, she mentions herself that she had a fairly high birth weight. I believe she was about 10 pounds when she was born, um, and, and that is uh, commonly associated with um, moms who are heavier as well. Is it difficult for someone like Rosie or any of us really to try and do well, try and eat well, if all the people around you are not doing well, not exercising, not eating well? So we know that how often a person eats and, and what they pick has a lot to do with their environment and their opportunity. And then the genes that we have have a lot to do with, for instance, how, how quick we stop eating and, mm -hmm. and how hungry uh, and how much we crave things. Um, so, so that environment is very key because um, if, again, she has that, that genetic tendency and her environment is one where, where food is always present and present at, at, at big emotional events on top of it or at, at uh, uh, eating is actually, I think she, she referred to her grandmother as a, as a food pusher, food pusher yeah. you actually learn to eat when you're not hungry. You learn to avoid some of your body's natural cues for stopping. Is this an uphill battle she's always going to face? When somebody develops um, obesity to a certain severity, um, the, the fat cells that we have um, first expand, mm -hmm. um, but they actually multiply over time. And, and so the short answer is yes, but the reason for it is, is that as she loses weight, and she's doing exactly what we hope people will do, which is change her approach and your lifestyle. She's eating differently every day. She's moving more every day, and she's, she's making those choices, so it's become a lifestyle for right. her. But the, the thing for her is, if she stops that, she will regain. Um, and on top of that, her ability to get the weight off um, is limited by how much weight she's had before. Basically, those fat cells that are still present that have multiplied make it tougher for her to accomplish what she's accomplishing. So her work is actually to be more admired because of the, the challenges she has from inside as well as outside. She mentioned diet on, diet off. I guess it's a yo-yo effect. How damaging is that to the body? You know, there's a lot of um, conflicting data on that, to be truthful. Mm -hmm. I, the bigger issue for a lot of commercial diets or um, different weight loss systems has to do with not having a practical way to adopt a different healthy way of eating long term. So it, it's more that people are doing something for 12 weeks and then they can't sustain it and they just go back to where they right. were and they don't learn anything. It, the idea of transforming diet for a lifetime or transforming activity levels as you're able to, I mean, she's doing more and more and more progressively for a lifetime is really the only um, practical road to improvement. Bottom line for all of us who are struggling, there is hope? Oh, there's absolutely hope. There's hope and there's more supports now than there used to be. There's more tools and I think culturally it's more acceptable to say, you know, I really need to make better choices. Dr. Eileen Seeholzer, thank you so much. You're welcome. This program about obesity is just one part of IdeaStream's ongoing multiple media health information series called Be Well. Obesity is such an important topic that we intend to bring you more radio, television, and web content for much of this year. Go to health.ideastream.org for links to articles, studies, stories, and local resources, all designed to help you better understand obesity and how you and your family can live healthier lives. Be sure to watch the web-exclusive interview I did with Dr. William Dietz, a nationally respected obesity expert who was in Cleveland for the Town Hall Speaker Series. You can also watch him interact with local school children who participated in an IdeaStream-produced distance learning education program. And be sure to listen to radio reports my colleague Ann Glosser filed. One examines bariatric surgery and when that procedure makes sense for obese people with diabetes. All this and much more when you go to health.ideastream.org. Another big cause of obesity stems from stress. Prolonged stress can cause your body to unleash a hormone called cortisol that increases your appetite. In some cases, chronic stress can actually cause the body's stress response system to get stuck in the on position, causing persistent hormonal problems that lead to diabetes and other complications. All this is magnified by the high levels of sugar, fat, and salt in fast food. Yes, I know, it's convenient, especially when you're on the go. David Rutan can tell you something about busy schedules, though, stress and how they increase our cravings for fast and easy comfort food. As we see in David's story, stress and bad eating habits become a vicious cycle that's hard to break. Hey, roll. Good and roll. My name's David Rutan. I'm 48. I'm a husband, a father. I have two children. <laughs> we are the typical American family of both parents working, having careers, uh, having children, and, those ch and the, the children being very active. Here's the dice. 
graduated in 1986 from the University of Akron. Uh, I have a, a degree in computer science. Uh, I went back to school and got a master's degree in information security. Hello. I work in the information technologies industry, work for a manufacturing company. There's a lot of deadlines, a lot of stress. There's people that need things that I have to get done for them. When David and his wife started their family, weight wasn't really an issue. But as their kids got older and more involved in sports, things began to change. My daughter started fencing about seven years ago. So you literally have spent hours upon hours here at the fencing studio. Yeah, we travel down, you know, three, four nights a week, and it's two to three hours a night. So we run down right after work. She practices. I'm doing here whatever I can get done. When my daughter wasn't fencing, my son was playing baseball somewhere. When he was with a club team, he had practice three or four nights a week. My daughter had practice three or four nights a week. So it was constantly get in the car, drop one off, drive back, pick up the other one, drive back, get the first one you dropped off. David is part of the sandwich generation, balancing kids, career, and aging parents. Both our mothers have passed away. Both of us have aging fathers. You know, the stress is a responsibility that you have to, just to make sure that you're doing what's, what, what they need. Ready? I think sometimes you, you kind of lose focus on what taking care of yourself versus taking care of the other people around you. And they become your priority and you start developing bad habits. Habits like not making time to exercise or relax. And good nutrition takes a back seat when there's barely time to eat. The more stressed, the, the, the worse you feel and the worse you eat. And it kind of snowballs a little bit and you kind of go through a cycle of, of you can't get out of that. I think once you get used to eating that, I think you do crave like, definitely like, like fries and uh, starches and uh, processed sugars. For David, the tipping point came when he hit 300 pounds. His blood pressure was up, so was his cholesterol. One day you wake up and you say, man, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. And I, and I got to look at where do I want to be? And I look and, I, and I'm thinking, man, I, I got to lose some weight. I got to, you know, I got to change some things in my life. And that's, that's kind of what was my wake up call to say, I, I need to change some things. David tried lots of different diets over the years. He lose some weight only to gain it back. He finally broke that unhealthy cycle by working with a specialist at Metro Health's weight management clinic. These days, David takes a break away from work to decompress and uses an app on his smartphone to eat healthier meals. I can scan the barcode and it brings all the nutritional information into the application and it tracks all that for me automatically. It's very important to record your, your food every day. It, it triggers things in your, your brain to stop eating and to, to be more in control of your eating. And it's really not a diet, it's really a change of lifestyle. David has been at this for three months and so far he's lost 35 pounds, but he knows he has further to go. Definitely got to work on exercise and fitting a routine of exercise in my lifestyle. It's still real easy not to routinely go to the gym or routinely uh, work out. So looking back now with everything you know, what were you doing wrong? Um, I, I think the biggest thing I did wrong was just not pay attention to what I was doing. You kind of get lost in, in all your other commitments and, and the stresses that you go through. Now with both kids in college, oh, yeah, exactly. David and his wife have more, have more time to focus on themselves. Places, but it was fun, but now it's time to do some different stuff. Yeah, yeah. Time, take time for us. Yep. David's story is all too familiar. A job, marriage, kids, caring for a parent. It's a delicate balancing act, and at times a three-ring circus starring stress, bad eating habits, and lack of exercise. Joining us now is Dr. Jeff Janata, a psychologist at UH Case Medical Center. Good to see you again. Good to see you, sir. Are people literally self-medicating when they eat due to stress? We can think of that in a couple of ways. The simple answer is yes. Uh, we use food often to regulate our stress. It comforts us and it uh, releases hormones uh, that contribute to our feeling better. David pointed out in the story we just saw that sugar, high fat, those things become kind of addictive. He started eating them, yeah. couldn't stop. Yeah. It, it, by virtue of its comforting factor, by virtue of the fact that when we eat 
high carbohydrate foods, we tend to feel more relaxed, we tend to feel better. The simplest explanation is that blood rushes to our gut and away from our brain and we feel better. Uh, but we also uh, know that now that uh, carbohydrate foods tend to be precursors mm -hmm. to serotonin, it helps our mood to improve and gradually over time we become dependent on that release. I know there are different kinds of stress. We have what we call fight or flight and then there's chronic stress that goes on and on. Yeah. It's the chronic kind, I guess, that leads to obesity? Well, it's one of the causes. Uh, chronic stress is just acute stress gone crazy. It is essentially mm -hmm. when normal healthy mechanisms for dealing with stress start to become typical. Our body stays in the mode that often we know as the kind of response we'll have if someone hits the brakes right in front of us and we get nervous and jittery, but we also go on high alert and that stress response is designed to allow our body to do that. Works very well in an, in a, an acute stressful situation, right. but over time, if it's chronically activated, then we really have a problem. I think people tend to believe we have a lot more stress in our lives today than we did a couple of generations ago, hence we eat more. Well, you know, that's always a little hard to tell. The stress, to some extent, is in the eye of the beholder. But there's no question that as a, uh, in our current culture, people will acknowledge high levels of stress as a function of many of the sorts of things that uh, David's story suggests to us. Now, I would come to you and say, how do I manage my stress without yeah. going through the mouth? <laughs> so what we would say, essentially, is I think it's a, a good thing to start with uh, an inventory of stresses begin to take a look at the things that are stressful in your life and be thoughtful and purposeful about developing strategies to deal with those stresses in ways that don't lead to the sorts of deleterious consequences that overeating does. Mm -hmm. So you might begin to think about uh, alternatives to eating, uh, whether that's recreational or distraction techniques or exercise or meditation, any of the sorts of things that we might ordinarily up front suggest might be more helpful to managing stress than a cheeseburger and fries. So I could train myself or even trick myself into not eating. You can train yourself. I don't know about trick yourself because you're probably in on the I'm trick. A tricky guy. Well, <laughs> but still, I think the idea is, yeah, you can mm -hmm. train yourself in the sense that you're trying to replace habits that lead to bad consequences with habits that are healthier. And the story that we saw with David, is that typical, he had so many things going on, the children, the wife, sure. the parents, yeah. that's what you see people falling down that Yeah, that people hole. will say they don't have time. Their lives move so quickly that they don't have time to plan healthier meals, they don't have time to, um, you know, they're rushing from one place to another and it's easy to go through a drive through and pick up something that, even if they know it's not good for them, it at least satisfies a, a, a need at the moment. And we all still do it. We Dr. Do. Jeff Giannotti, UH Case Medical Center, thanks for coming in. Thank you, sir. African-American women have the highest rate of being overweight or obese more than any other group in the U.S. In fact, African-American women are 70 percent more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic white women. And it's no surprise that poverty plays a big role in this health disparity. People in low-income neighborhoods are more likely to live in so-called food deserts, neighborhoods with limited access to large grocery stores that sell fresh produce. Instead, there's a proliferation of fast food restaurants and corner stores with lots of cheap junk food. 25% of Cuyahoga County residents live in food deserts. In our next story, we meet Nikki Collins, who gives us a taste of what it's like to be poor, live near a food desert, and against those odds, still try to feed her large family healthy meals. So, we, so all we could do was to sit, 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 sit. sit. What did you do with my, um, this right? I'm a homemaker. I, I consider myself to be a homemaker, and this is my job as, as a parent to raise my kids. I try to keep my kitchen clean, keeping the dishes together, and like I said, they, they come in and it's a hustle and bustle trying to get them a snack. You got practice? Where you get that from? Come in. You got a game now, Nikki, her husband, and their six children live in a public housing apartment complex on Cleveland's Near East Side. There you go. And I'm on welfare. We survive on food stamps. Usually, I try to keep up with all of the meals that I want to make. Like today is the 15th. I'll count down because I get my stamps like in the next month. How many days I have? It's heartbreaking to me. 
it really is heartbreaking because of me trying to look like at the end of the month my kids they are hungry they want a snack but I don't have that all the time and it, it really hurts my feelings not to have that all the time because they'll be hungry you know and they need that energy there's another snack that I'm fixing but I still stretch it out to the point where all of us can eat I still have to go to food centers sometimes to fill up my pantry usually when I make a meal I'll minimize my meat but everybody gets a piece like say a little bit of um stew beef can go a long way we can eat all of this rice in one month and this is like a 10 pound bag and this is what i buy every month so this is what we'll eat this is my meal filler the family doesn't own a car once a month nikki gets a ride to a large wholesale grocery store where she buys things in bulk she says sometimes people give her looks for buying so much and then they'll look at my weight and see, you know, how, and I'll see the look on their face. And it kind of makes me upset because I know I'm a little bit overweight for my height. And, you know, but it's like, well, you don't know the story. So how can you judge? Like, how can you look with a judge on your face? The truth is people who live in poor neighborhoods are more likely to be obese than those from higher income areas. One reason stems from the fact many low-income neighborhoods lack safe, accessible places to exercise. Food deserts are another issue. The term refers to poor access to fresh and healthy food. Nikki lives on the edge of one. If you live in a food desert and you're hungry, the closest place to eat is often a fast food restaurant or convenience store. So we're gonna see exactly what one of these little neighborhood grocery stores has inside. We got a lot of noodles, easy stuff, fast stuff to prepare. Some of the kids around here, they're eating um, the TV dinners and they're eating oodles of noodles and they're eating a whole lot of junk food. But it's still a matter of knowledge on how and what to eat. What nutritional things can we buy that are cheap and that we can use. And so the recipes that you're learning in class today, they're helpful, they're tasty, and are they quick? Yeah. They're quick. Here's where Pat Legrand comes in. She's a chef and registered dietitian who grew up in Harlem, New York. She knows what it's like to be poor. Chef Pat is teaching a healthy cooking class for public housing residents in a pilot project. It involves Case Western Reserve University, the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, and the Ohio State University Extension. You have to start educating people, teaching them to read a food label, uh, teaching them that they're even on a limited budget, there are ways to embrace a healthier lifestyle. You make it real, you make it livable, when you can smell it, taste it, see it, feel it. We have to relearn and, and retrain ourselves for a healthier lifestyle. That's her bowl. She, she want rice. A couple years ago, Nikki took a nutrition class, and she tries to apply what she's learned. I don't do the canned vegetables because it's got a lot of sodium. Frozen is my best bet. That's my closest thing to fresh vegetables. That's your rice and your cream of mushroom. Life remains a struggle but Nikki's trying to do the best she can for her kids. I hope that they grow up to be respectable, well-rounded people, let alone well-nourished. Cute kids there. I'm here with Dr. Carla Harwell, Medical Director of University Hospital's Otis Moss Junior Health Center. Dr. Harwell, you treat a lot of low-income patients right in the middle of one of these so-called food deserts. Absolutely. Yes, my practice is in the Fairfax community, mm -hmm. which is primarily African-American and lower income uh, individuals. We saw the point there that many people in neighborhoods like Fairfax and other parts of Cleveland in the country do suffer because of the food desert system, the way it's put together, the way that they don't have food to go to. And it does lead to obesity. It does. I mean, when you don't have access to the healthier foods and the things that could really make a difference in your choices in terms of what you, you know, how you prepare your meals, then that's a problem if you don't have access to that. 
it's really a struggle for people like Nikki trying to do the right thing. Right, and she is. She's trying to do the right thing. She's making some healthy choices. You know, she's picking frozen vegetables over canned. I mean, there are some substitutions. There's some little things that you can do, but when you're on a fixed income and you know, you're in a, a food desert, I mean, the choices become hard. There may be people watching who are saying, you know, until now I hadn't heard this phrase. Why is there this concentration of area without food? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad. I mean, it's, it's sad when you're, you know, you're in a neighborhood that you don't have access to, to healthy, fresh fruits, um, even in terms of tackling obesity. You know, if you want to exercise, you may live in an area that's, you know, have a high crime rate, you know, and there's no place for you to walk or there's no greenery. So a lot of things contribute to this. And when we, when we use the term, you know, food desert, you know, we are talking about access to, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and healthier uh, food choices. But we also have to look at the big picture. It's not just the fact that, you know, you're in a food desert, but if you look at the big picture, your neighborhood also contributes to, you know, how likely you are, you know, to feel safe to even be able to go out and exercise. Not that anyone accepts the idea of obesity, but because they're in a desert like this, they may see more obesity around them. Does it become a culturally acceptable situation? Well, you know, there's a phrase, they'll be what they see. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes if that's all you see, if that's all, you know, and, and you're told that, not necessarily that it's okay, but it seems, it seems to be okay because that's mm -hmm. all you see. So, you know, they'll, they'll be what they see. You mentioned the fact that it's dangerous to walk in some areas or people mm -hmm. may perceive it that way. Mm -hmm. Lack of exercise has to be as big a contributor here as the lack of fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. I mean, you know, any, any successful diet has two parts to it. You know, it's, it's the food choices that you make and then it's also being able to exercise. Now, while it's true that, you know, you can exercise sometimes in the comfort of your own home, but if you want to get out and walk, you know, um, and you're in a neighborhood where that's not safe to do, then you're not going to do it if you don't feel safe. Okay, we've scared people enough here. We <laughs> saw the one class that was helping from CMHA in Ohio State. Mm -hmm. What are other things that you tell people who you come in contact with who have the situation that they can do for themselves? Well, like Nikki was doing, you know, I try to teach them that there are some substitutions and some choices that you can make. Um, you know, try to steer away from, you know, the, the, the foods that are high in carbs and, and the starches. Although, you know, when you're on a fixed budget, you know, a five pound bag of potatoes can go a long way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we just try to show how, you know, it's okay to eat French fries, you know, it's okay to eat hamburgers and hot dogs, but everything is in moderation. And so what I try to teach is that when you're on a fixed income and your choices aren't what, you know, you'd like them to be, if you're, if you're, if you live near a food desert, you know, you just have to try to make the best choices that you can make within the, you know, the, the constraints of what you have to deal with monetarily. We saw Kay Colby walk into the store there and it was just mm -hmm. lines and lines of Doritos and other similar type foods. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that those of you in the health industry can say to the convenience stores, can you give us a little bit of space <laughs> on the end here? Can you try and help? Well, I mean, you know, that's hard, you know, and I even look at fast foods, you know. I mean, if you can go to a fast food place and get two burgers for, you know, two dollars, but you want to eat a salad, well, the salad costs five dollars. Right. You know, so what are you going to do? You know, you get two for two, you know, two for two or, you know, try to pick something healthier. So, I mean, it's not just the convenience stores. I mean, it's, it's really our whole society. You know, it's the whole fast food industry. I mean, uh, plates and portion sizes are so much larger in, in restaurants. I mean, everything has just been, you know, blown up. And, and that's what we tend to eat. And so unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, I think this is a, a national uh, problem, not just, you know, an individual neighborhood issue. I mean, th this is everywhere. And lastly, Cleveland, one of the national leaders in community gardens. Is that a great start? That is a great start. I mean, when you can go to a community and engage a community to become active participants in trying to grow, you know, some of these healthy vegetables so that you can be able to make better food choices. I mean, we need to we need to have more of those. Dr. Carla Harwell, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. In this program, we've pulled back the many layers of obesity to help you better understand the problem, why it's an epidemic and what you and your family can do to fight against fat. We looked at the CDC's so-called fat maps to better understand the origins of the obesity epidemic. We heard from Randy, his unforgettable experience at Cedar Point, and how the typical American lifestyle of bad eating habits and no exercise can sneak up on you. We learned that fat is not in the eye of the beholder, but rather in a simple mathematical formula called BMI that was created in 1835 by a Belgian statistician. 
Rosie's story revealed that the war against weight can sometimes involve our own DNA, as well as long-held family traditions that are often hard to break. Stress is a major contributor to the obesity epidemic. David's story showed how prolonged stress can cause your body to unleash a hormone that increases your appetite. And Nikki showed us how being poor and living near a food desert makes eating healthy meals much more complicated and challenging. We want to thank all the people who shared their stories and the medical experts who provided their depth and insights. One final reminder to visit our website at health.ideastream.org for a list of resources, more stories, and no or low-cost ways you and your family can lead healthier lives. You will also find a link to our partner, Net Wellness, a consumer information website from Case Western Reserve University, The Ohio State University, and the University of Cincinnati. For all my colleagues here at IdeaStream, I'm Rick Jackson. Thanks so much for watching and be well. This was a presentation of Be Well, a multiple media health information project presented by WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Funding comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, the Woodruff Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County.